But I also want to talk about, and that'll be a big part of the presentation, the influence of Marcus Garvey in places and spaces where a lot of us, um, you know, are not aware of. So, Brother Zama, <clears throat> let me begin to show the photos and we can go from there. And then I'll save some time at the end for um, a nice, uh, nice, healthy discussion period. Okay. All right. Let's go to full screen. This is one of my favorite pictures of Garvey. Uh, before the presentation began, we were talking about Garvey in a, a suit and tie. And other than the admiral uniform, I don't know if I've ever seen him in a picture without a suit and tie. Garvey, in many ways, and I don't know how you'll take this, but in many ways was conservative in that sense. He was born in Jamaica, uh, as you know, on August 17th, 1887, and it was a British colony at that time. And so we are, whether we like it or not, no matter how African we call ourselves, we are also the in which we are born. Go ahead, brother. Now, I want to talk about those who came before Garvey and lead up to Garvey himself. And then, again, the contemporary uh, contemporaries of Garvey and then the successors and influences of Garvey. And to do that, we could go back to um, Jamaica itself and show this photograph. I'm not just talking about, I'm going to talk largely about people who have Pan-Africanist orientation. And so that means I'm not going to spend a lot of time on traditional African-American heroes and sheroes like Harriet Tubman. I would be curious to know if she had an African worldview. We know she's a great resistance fighter. We know she's one of our greatest leaders, but I've never heard anybody talk about how Harriet may have viewed Africa or her link to Africa. And I'm not going to talk about Frederick Douglass because Douglass, while a great leader, an abolitionist, a fiery orator, is not what I could call a Pan-Africanist. So I want to talk about people who come to us, in my opinion, in that, from that perspective. Now, Nanny is directly from Africa. In all likelihood, she was born in Ghana, and she is the great early resistance leader to enslavement in Jamaica. She is a leader of the Maroons in the western half of Jamaica. Who are the Maroons? The Maroons were the runaways who not only ran away, but who went into the bush in the interior and established their own communities. Nanny is a warrior queen. She is supposed to have been able to capture bu bullets fired by the British in her buttocks, and not only that, fire them back at the British. That's quite a sister. I'd like to, to meet a woman like that. Nanny is, one, is the only female national hero or shero of Jamaica. And then right here in Babylon, USA, we have a whole series of these race men and race women. Race men and race women, that's a term, I guess, that comes to us in the 19th century. And race men and race women were people whose whole mission in life was uplifting the race. They were dedicated to the black community. They may have had different occupations. They may have had different statuses in society. But their whole aim was to uplift the black community. And I think all of us fit in that category who are here today. This is one of my favorites and a wonderful black and white photograph. This is Reverend Henry Highland Garnett. Uh, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, I don't know where he was born. I think he was born in 1815. And he became a minister of the Presbyterian Church or Presbyterian Church in Troy, New York a church that is to have a long legacy. And he was famous for saying, let your motto be resistance. He carried a shotgun. He was nobody to play with. He's a fiery orator. And he talked about the African roots of Nile Valley civilization. So one of the things I want to do with many of the people I'm going to talk about tonight is to show the connection between activism and knowledge of self. Kwame Nkrumah, who I consider a brother or a nephew of Garvey, in a sense, used to say, thought without practice is empty and action without thought is blind. In other words, we must be thinkers and doers, and we must have a profound sense of knowledge of self. That's the guideline. African proverb goes, if you know the beginning well, the ending will not trouble you. So this is uh, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, 
There's a book about him by Earl Afari Hutchinson, and the title is Let Your Model Be Resistance. Now, this brother comes a little bit later, and this is the famous Edward Wilmot Blyden. And Garvey would say, if you want to know something about your history, Blyden is the man. Blyden was born in August, I think August 3rd, I believe 1832, in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And he is one of the founding fathers of the modern states of Liberia, Liberia and Sierra Leone. I think he was very disappointed in what happened to them and the leadership. He is a brilliant intellectual. He went to Kemet, went to Egypt in 1866. And he said, the blood began to pulse through my, I mean, rush through my veins and my pulse began to, ra to race. And if I could have called out to every African in the world, I would have said, we take our fame. This is the great Edward Wilmot Blyden. And then here's another predecessor of Garvey. Remember, Garvey didn't just pop out of nowhere. Garvey came out of a context. Everything comes out of a context. And in order to understand it and understand the individual, we need to understand the context, what produced it. And it's also a wonderful thing just to pay tribute to these great black men and women, these great Africans who labored in such difficult circumstances. This is Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. Bishop Turner was a, a bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There's a wonderful book that's written about him, or of which he is the centerpiece, called Black Exodus, Back to Africa Movements from 1875 to 1900. From 1865 to 1877, you have what is called Black Reconstruction. The war is over. You do have certain sympathizers in high positions, and federal troops are in the South, in 1877, there is a major election between the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes, and the Southern Democrat, Samuel Tilden. And the race is very close. So they made a compromise. And the compromise was Rutherford Hayes would occupy the White House, but federal troops will be pulled out of the South. And this begins in 1877. And as a result of that, Black people are left on their own. And so you have the rise of the KKK, the white supremacist organizations, terrorist organizations that ter terrorized our people. Uh, Jim Crow, the Black Codes, um, separate but unequal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of Black folk raised up. Some tried to go back to Africa, and others went to places like Oklahoma and Kansas, where they established all Black cities and communities. That's how Tulsa got to be. Black Wall Street got to be, and that was the impetus for it. There's another one in Oklahoma, I believe it's Oklahoma, Boley, Oklahoma. And Henry Manuel Turner was right in the middle of that. Around 1899 or so, he went to South Africa, and he wrote a paper, called, I think it's called Jesus Christ Was a Negro, or Was Jesus Christ a Negro? That was bold talk back then. For some people, <laughs> it's still bold talk. And of course, you can't really have a serious discussion about Garvey without talking about Booker T. Washington. He wrote the book Up From Slavery, and that book influenced a lot of people, including two or three that I'm gonna talk about tonight. But it also influenced Marcus Garvey. Garvey is born in Jamaica as a young man. He travels around Central, Central America, British Honduras, which is now Belize, uh, Costa Rica, Panama. And he saw that the condition of black folk was pretty much the same. And so he decided to come to the United States or go to the United States, go to Babylon and meet Booker T. Washington and see how he could build an industrial institution like Tuskegee in Jamaica. And you know the story, by the time he gets there, Booker T. is an ancestor and Garvey decides to do a whirlwind tour of the United States. He travels around and says the condition is the same. And he builds his base and you all can correct me as I go along. Certainly in the question and answer period, the discussion period, he builds his base in New York City. He's assisted by people like John Edward Bruce, who was actually born into slavery, a brother called Bruce Grit, and that's what they call him, and assisted by people like Hubert Henry Harrison, who was from the Caribbean and apparently, according to the stories, was a better orator than Garvey, and that's saying a lot. These brothers 
would stand on soap boxes, on step ladders, on the street corners of Harlem, and crowds would begin to come. And the story is Garvey would get so pumped up, sometimes he'd fall off the ladder and they'd just brush him off and put him right back up there. But Booker T was the great African leader, African-American leader after Frederick Douglass. And of course, he had a lot of clout in the black community. I think he needs to be looked at again from the perspective of Pan-Africanism and do for self. So this is Booker T. Washington. And one of my favorites, <clears throat> Martin Robeson Delaney, who went to Harvard, the first class of Africans to go to Harvard, to be allowed to go. Of course, he was kicked out. Those white students wasn't gonna have him. So he was there for about six months. He claimed that he was descended from royalty on both sides of his family. He claimed that he had never been contaminated with the blood of a white man. He named all his children after famous Africans. He named one after Ramses the Great. He named another one after a Cuban revolutionary. He named another one after, I believe, Alexander Dumas, uh, an Ethiopian emperor. And that was the way he thought. Frederick Douglass would later say about Delaney, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I thank God for making me a man. But when Delaney wakes up, he always thanks God for making me, making him a black man. He is the first African-American to be, or African black man to be, to be commissioned an officer in the Union Army. He wrote a book, again, going back to knowledge of self, one of my central themes. He wrote a book about the African roots of Nile Valley civilization, a very scholarly work. He is a brilliant man. He goes to Africa looking for a place for us to repatriate. Where would we go? And I believe Nigeria was one of the places he went to. He bought a whole wardrobe, all these Nigerian clothes. And so he is the first African-American scholar to wear African clothes when he lectured. And he is famous for the expression, Africa for the Africans. Long before Garvey, the way he ran it down was, Africa for the Africans with black men to rule them. That was the way they talked at the time. And Garvey obviously modified it to Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. This is Reverend Martin Robeson Delaney, Reverend Doctor. And then this is simply, not simply, this is another one of the great historians of that time. This is Rufus Lewis, Hitt, Rufus Lewis Perry, who was born in slavery in Smith County, Tennessee. I think Nashville was the seat. Around 1834, he eventually escaped and became a brilliant scholar. He wrote a pamphlet in 1887 called The Cushite, and in 1893, a large book with the same name, talking about the African roots of Nile Valley civilization. And he was a Baptist uh, preacher. Now, these, this, the next three or four images just kind of give us a sense as to the conditions that Garvey was operating in. 1914, Firstly, all of Africa is colonized. Few exceptions, Ethiopia, I, technically, I guess, Liberia and Sierra Leone in the West. But for the most part, Africa had been gobbled up by the Europeans. You know, the famous conference, the Berlin Conference, 1885-86, where all the major European powers, plus the United States and Russia, gathered together in Berlin under the auspices of um, Bismarck, and talked about why, I mean, why should they fight? There's enough of Africa for everybody. Let's cut it up like a cake. You can see the French got a lot. That's the French in the red. And then, of course, in the blue, the British were not cheated. But a lot of people are not aware that the Germans were major colonizers of Africa. They have Tanganyika or Tanzania, Rwanda, what is now Namibia, Cameroon, Togo. The Italians had Libya, Eritrea, parts of Somalia. Uh, even the Spanish had a piece over here, Spanish Sahara, what is now called Western Sahara. So that was, that was Africa at the time Marcus Garvey is on the scene. And then the terrorism in the United States. In 1919, you have what's called Red Summer. During World War I, um, a lot of people uh, went, in, went in the war, and there were uh, vacancies. I, how do I put it? There were employment opportunities. Remember, the South is tough now. Thousands of lynchings. So a lot of people, a lot of Black folk who could, migrated to the northern states in places like Detroit, um, Philadelphia, 
all the major cities, Chicago, all the major cities in the north. So there were there were tensions. So 1919 is called Red Summer, and this is a time when black communities were being attacked, but of course lynchings. And I found this newspaper article just a couple of days ago. Listen, look, 3,000 will burn Negro. Think about that. They advertised it. John Hartfield will be lynched by Ellisville mob at five o'clock this afternoon. Stony the road we've tried. And then this is what they were talking about. We've seen these images and they're horrifying. Some people say we shouldn't show them, but I think people really need to see the brutalities that we have suffered. And this could just, easy, just as easily be black women hanging up there, men castrated, burnt at the stake. And this is what Garvey is operating. So Garvey is not just brilliant, he's not just a genius, but there's a tremendous amount of frustration and anxiety and fear and anger. And Garvey was able to galvanize a lot of that. And then look, this is just horrific. How could you treat a human being like that? But this is what our people were going through. And so here comes Marcus Mosiah Garvey on the scene. So a few images of Garvey himself. Somebody has explained to me who these brothers were, but I can't recall right now. Does anybody know of him? All right, anyway. Very powerful picture. We can talk about it at the end. And of course, Garvey, just a few images of Garvey. This is my favorite. With best wishes, your obedient servant, Marcus Garvey, the famous admiral photo. This one I photographed a year ago uh, with some Rastafarians in Santiago, Chile. And they were celebrating uh, Marcus Garvey's birthday. In fact, I even called Brother Singhor on the phone and he was able to give them a short address. This is right outside Santiago, Chile. This just shows the influence of Garvey internationally. Well, here's another one <laughs> where he doesn't have a suit and a tie. <laughs> and then Garveyism. We are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, None but ourselves can free the mind. Does that sound familiar? Of course, Bob Marley incorporated that in his famous song. Um, this is Marcus Garvey speaking in Minulik Hall. Minulik had to be named after Emperor Minulik of Ethiopia, but yes. this is in Sydney, Nova Scotia in 1913, just three years before he died. And then of course, he Thank said, you. without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. And then this is, a, he was hard here. I have no desire. You know, Garvey is characterized oftentimes as a back to Africa leader. And I think that deserves a little more nuance. He said, I have no desire to take all black people back to Africa. There are blacks who are no good here and, like, and likewise will be no good there. That's a brutal thing to say, but truer words have never been spoken. And then, Marcus Garvey, the vision of black grandeur. Now here is a pyramid. And the reason I put this up here is just to illustrate the point that Garvey was probably not what we could call a classical historian, but Garvey clearly understood the importance of history. And that's why Garvey and I go together like hand and glove. Because if I'd been around at the time, I would have been right in the thick of it. Let me read a passage from Philosophy and Opinions. And this is printed in the book of Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa, which I wrote an introduction to. Listen to this. We are satisfied to know that our race gave the first great civilization to the world. And for centuries, Africa, our ancestral home, was a great seat of learning. And when black men who were only fit then in the company of the gods were philosophers, artists, scientists, and men of vision and leadership, the people of other races were groping in savagery, darkness, and continental barbarism. Black men were so powerful in the early days of history that they were able to impress their civilizations, culture, and racial characteristics and features upon the people of Asia and Southern Europe. The dark Spaniards, Italians, and Asiatics 
are the colored offspring of a powerful black African civilization and nationalism. Any other statement by historians to the contrary is bunk. It should not be swallowed by the enlightened Negro. And that's pretty powerful. So I just use this to illustrate that, that Garvey was able to make the connection between what we once did and what we are capable of doing. Now, let me show you a few other images. I've been able to visit on my first occasion, on my first visit to Jamaica, and my third and last uh, visit to Jamaica, hopefully I'll go again, I was able to visit on the first trip, the birthplace of Garvey, and on the last trip where Garvey is buried. Let me show you some of those pictures. Some of them are a bit personal. This is where Garvey was actually born, in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. The house is actually there. Some of you all have probably been there and seen it. It hasn't been very well taken care of, I must say. And you have this bust of Garvey. There's a street named after him real close. And then this is the printer, a printery that Garvey worked in. Garvey was a printer. And I was able to visit that place. Now it's an internet cafe. At least it was the last time I was there. And these nice a mosaic, a painting. And Rastafarians were the ones who were taking care of it when I was there. There's the red, the black, and the green. And then this is where Garvey was buried. Garvey died in London. Uh, he was um, railroaded, as you know, put in prison, and then deported back to Jamaica, which was still a British colony. Things didn't go very well for him there. And he went to live in England, and that was a very difficult and challenging situation. So he died there. And eventually, the body was exhumed and sent to Kingston, where he's buried right now. This is the actual burial place of Marcus Garvey. And this is the bust that sits right atop there in a mosaic. And very close to it is a museum dedicated to Marcus Garvey. I was told that the desk that I'm sitting at was owned by Marcus Garvey, so I couldn't wait to squeeze in there. And this is a poor picture, but the best I could get from that museum of Marcus Garvey and Amy Jakes Garvey. And she was a significant sister in her own right. Julius Garvey has told me on more than one occasion, and it was really Julia, I'm sorry, Amy Jakes Garvey that kept the family together. And she said, be not discouraged, black women of the world, but push forward regardless of the lack of appreciation shown you. And then this is Garvey and Amy Jakes. Now, you know, his first wife was Amy Ashwood. And Amy Jakes was <laughs> Amy Ashwood's secretary. So I would imagine that must have been a real, real, real scandal there. But anyway, this is Marcus Garvey and Amy Jakes Garvey. And here she is again. And then his contemporary, his rival, his competitor. What do you say about W.B. Du Bois? Du Bois lived to be about 100 years old. He is born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 868, 1868. And in my opinion, he is the greatest intellectual that America has produced. If he was a white man, we know his name like we know the name of Einstein, an anthropologist, a journalist, a sociologist. He's a bad brother. He's an intellectual, though. Garvey is the mass leader. Du Bois challenged and fought with Booker T. Washington. And later on, after what appeared to be a cordial relationship, it turned very, very, very sour. And so Du Bois's role in the downfall of Garvey or the challenges that Garvey was forced to confront need to be examined. But still, I think we need, need to look at the totality of his life, not just a portion, because I would imagine, even though there may be some exceptions here, that the people even listening were not born into consciousness. We learned that, we evolved. I would imagine all of us can look back at something that we did or chapters in our life that we are not proud of, but we were able to survive that and grow beyond that. And Du Bois, I think we can say that about him. This is the Du Bois Library in Accra, Ghana. Sister took me around, you know the story that in the latter part of his life, he was invited to Ghana by none other than Osajipo Kwame Nkrumah to compile an encyclopedia of African people. So ironically enough, Du Bois dies in Ghana working on an encyclopedia for African people. And there's his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, because after all, what good is a king without a queen? 
And this is Du Bois's burial place. That's his tomb, his sarcophagus. And Shirley Graham is buried right by him. And this is Du Bois's library. I think I might have even donated a book or two there. This is all in Accra. One of his contemporaries is the great Jay Rogers, who knew Garvey as a boy in Jamaica. Rogers was born in 1883, 1880 or 1883. Garvey is born in 1887. Rogers in his book, World's Great Men of Color, I believe in the second volume, there's a small chapter on Garvey. Jay Rogers is a person that I most often proudly compare to. He is a pioneer anthro photojournalist. Long before Renoko Rashidi was a twinkle in anybody's eye, Rogers was traveling around the world, taking photographs, going into museums, writing books, and writing for the Negro press, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, the Amsterdam News, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Negro press he is also important to us because he is the major African-American, even though he's from Jamaica, African-American, because I'm talking about all of the Americans, war correspondent to go to Ethiopia when it was invaded by the Italian fascists in 1935. And this created a sensation. Kwame Nkrumah is moving from Gold Coast to Ghana right around the time of the invasion. Okay. African-Americans were incensed. Ethiopia was perceived as the last independent African nation, and the Italians are going to invade it and use mustard gas. So it was an outrage, and many African-Americans wanted to go to Ethiopia to fight, and that was prevented in large measure by the U.S. government. So Rogers went there and covered it. And when he came back, the first presentation that he did in Pittsburgh, more than 7,000 people came because they wanted to know what was happening there. One of the worst things that has happened to us as a result of enslavement and colonization, it has, in a sense, divided us from Africa. And this is why Garvey is so important. Garvey never set foot in Africa. Garvey didn't have Instagram. Garvey didn't have Facebook. Garvey didn't have Zoom. He didn't have WebEx. He didn't have TV. He didn't have the radio. A short, dark-skinned black man with a thick accent, and yet he shook the rafters. And he was able to galvanize millions of people around the issue of African redemption. He had a black shipping line, you know that, a black nursing corps, a black army. He said God was black. So these are pictures of Rogers' rare photographs around 1930. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures. Zama may have taken this picture. And this is um, this is at the Davis, Cent Davis Dance Center, I believe. And this in Washington, D.C., this is Gail Hansberry, who is the, one of the daughters of the great William Leo Hansberry. Now, there's a story that, John, that uh, W. Paul Coe shot down, but it's a nice story. And that is Garvey was sometimes... <laughs> take the train down from New York's Penn Station down to Washington, D.C., and go to Howard University and hang out with William Lil Hansberry and talk about African history for a day. Uh, Coates says, no, Renoko, that didn't happen, but it sure sounds good. Hansberry is one of our greatest scholars, and every time I go to D.C. and Gail comes, it's a, it's a thrill for me. And she says, Renoko, my father would have loved your work, and that's all I need to hear. And then you have during the same time, we certainly don't want to leave the sisters out, scholars like Drusilla Dungy Houston, who wrote the book, One for Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. She is a race woman, and she um, also covered, she's a journalist, and she covered the destruction of Black Wall Street in 1921. Drusilla Dungy Houston. And here I am, now Singor took this picture. This is in Washington, D.C., and here I am standing next to a relatively new statue of the great Carter G. Woodson. The UNIA, Carter G. Woodson would lecture before the UNIA, like Rogers. And the Negro world would review the books of Hansberry, I'm sorry, not Hansberry, but Rogers and Carter G. Woodson. And you know, Carter G. Woodson is the brother. Here he is, my favorite picture of him. And the statue, he's the founder in 1926 or he initiated in large measure Negro History Week, which in 1970 became Black History Month. And he is the founder of the Journal of Negro History. And he's the author of many books, including this one, The Miseducation of the Negro, in which he famously said, and we can repeat this all day long, 
If you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. If you control a man's thinking, you got him. He will instinctively go to the back door. And if there is no back door, he will seek to create one. His conditioning dictates that. If you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. Similar to Stephen Biko, um, the greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. This is in the Schoenberg Library in Harlem, New York. And this is a statue of County Cullen. County Cullen is an important member of the Garvey or Harlem Renaissance. And he did a famous poem in, in which he included the lyrics, what is Africa to me? What is Africa to me? And I think that we are still grappling with that even now. Ida B. Wells, who married a man named Barnett, and she became Ida B. Wells Barnett. In public, she called her husband Mr. Barnett, but she was so confident in who she was and she was so liberated, she named her firstborn daughter Ida B. Wells Jr. <laughs> A little petite sister used to carry two and three pistols around with her. Why would she do that? Because she would go to the places where our people were being terrorized and she'd write about it, reports to the Negro press, lynchings and what have you. She's called a crusader for justice. And she lectured with Garvey. I've seen a flyer. I don't know where I saw it with her and Garvey lecturing together. And she knew the Bois as well. Ida B. Wells, born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, I believe on July 16th, 1862 or thereabouts. Another Garveyite historian, this is George Wells Parker. Parker was a founder of a publication called the, or an organization called the Hamitic League of the World. He was in Omaha, Nebraska. Let me pick up the pace because I still have a lot more to cover. This is William Henry Ferris, who was another great historian he wrote a two volume book around 1913, 1914 called The African Abroad. And he was an early editor of uh, the Negro world. Noble Drew Ali comes out of the same period. You've heard of the Morris Science Temple and Noble Drew Ali, he comes out of the same period. He and Garvey were contemporaries. And Alfonso Schoenberg, very, very similar, one in Puerto Rico, who brought a Hispanic element to the movement. The Schoenberg Library in Harlem is named after him. It was initially his initial, his, his own personal or private collection of books. I think he sold it to the New York Public Library for about 10 grand. He was a mason and he was a postman and he was a writer and a collector of rare books. Now Garvey didn't just influence Africans, black folk. Garvey had a global influence. And in Asia, the two people that he had to me, the most significant impact on is number one here, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh, the great leader of the Vietnamese people, uh, lived in Harlem at the same time Garvey was there. And he would attend um, Garvey's lectures, okay? And, and go, to, go to meetings, at least I'm told that. And he was very much influenced by what he heard. He wrote articles in the newspaper about the evils of lynchings. And when he finally goes back to Vietnam, he tells the American soldiers, the African-American soldiers, we never called you the N-word. We never took your land. Why are you here? And he would attempt strategically to divide the white soldiers and the black soldiers. This is the great Ho Chi Minh is one of my favorites. And another person that is near and dear to me, and we'll talk about him a little more, and that is B.R. Embedkar, Dr. Um, Bimrao Ambedkar, a Dalit and untouchable fr from India, who also read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. And somehow, as an untouchable, as a Dalit, was able to leave India and go to Columbia University where he got a law degree. And he is in Harlem in the early years of the Garvey movement. And I'm gonna, he is the great leader of the Dalits, the black untouchables. I mean, he is like next to, God to them. If you've heard of the untouchables or the Dalits and you want to get in with them, all you have to do is say something good about B.R. Ambedkar and you're tight. On my first trip to India, I was invited to put a garland at a historic conference of untouchables around a, a painting, a photograph of Ambedkar. And on my last trip in 1999 in Aurangabad, uh, India, 
being photographed putting a garland around the statue. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad comes out of that same picture. I mean, that same period. Some have even said that he was a member of the UNIA. I don't know that with certainty, but these are the times that were producing these sisters and brothers. And it needs to be looked at a lot more. There's a wonderful book called Black Power in the Garvey Movement by a man named Theodore Vincent. Excellent book, Black Power in the Garvey Movement. And then you could say, we know that Malcolm came under the strong influence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he also read uh, Carter G. Wilson and Jay Rogers, but Malcolm's parents were Garveyites. And so in my opinion, my humble opinion, we could even say that Malcolm was a son of Garvey. He said, I want to be remembered as someone that was sincere, even if I made mistakes, they were in sincerity. If I was wrong, I was wrong in sincerity. I can deal with a person that's wrong as long as they are sincere. So some beautiful pictures of Malcolm. On one of my early trips to Boston, I gave a lecture and I stayed in this hotel and I found out that Malcolm X actually worked in this hotel when he was Detroit Red in Boston. Our Black Shining Prince. Malcolm the Family Man. Sometimes I think we forget that Malcolm and Martin were taken away from us when they were very, very, very young. They were in their 30s. This is the rare photograph of um, young Malcolm giving an award to the great historian Jay Rogers. This was in a Muhammad Speaks newspaper about 1959. And then this one is so important. People change. Don't give up on our youth. We could almost say we could change that and we could say people change. <laughs> Don't give up on our people because I know that is frustrating sometimes. Sometimes it may, you, we do things and it just makes you want to say black people. What? What? what have, you know what I'm talking about. It's easy to get frustrated. You can even get tired. You can curse us out. You can take a break, but you can't give up. So Malcolm transforms from a common criminal through knowledge of self to our black shining prince. And I like this. Men who are proud of being black marry black women. Women who are proud of being black marry black men. If you can find one, just beautiful photos. And then of course, Malcolm and Martin. Now, Martin Luther King went to Jamaica and paid homage to Garvey. I believe it was 1965, after he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He went to Jamaica, and he, he paid tribute to Marcus. A lot of people don't know that. All we hear is, I have a dream. I've looked over and been to the promised land, or those famous speeches, not to minimize them. But what I'm trying to say is that there's another side to MLK that we need to examine. Martin Luther King, the family man. King went to Africa. King was very interested in the African liberation struggle. And he connected with Kwame Nkrumah, who was influenced by Garvey. In fact, there's a Black Star Square in Ghana. I believe the shipping line is called the Black Star Line, if I'm not mistaken, in Ghana. So King goes to Ghana, and he's there on March 6, 1957, when Ghana becomes independent under Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. It moves from the British colony a Gold Coast to Ghana. A brother named Donkwa is largely responsible for that name change. When some of these African countries became independent, they wanted to take inspiration from ancient African civilizations. So part of the French Sudan became Mali, and Abyssinia becomes Ethiopia, and Gold Coast becomes Ghana. So here is Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah, the Redeemer, with the great Patrice Lumumba from Congo. And his motto was Africa must unite. And it's still our motto, Africa must unite. Africans must, must unite. Now, Ghana becomes independent on March 6, 1957. And Nkrumah says, independence of Ghana doesn't mean a lot unless all of Africa becomes independent. And Africa will never be strong until Africa is united. So in 1958, he calls the first modern Pan-African conference in Ghana and the All-African People's Conference. 
All the great African freedom fighters came there. Patrice Lumumba left the Congo for the first time. Robert Mugabe came. Emmanuel Cabral from Guinea-Bissau came. France Fanon, the author of Wretched of the Earth, Black Skin, White Mess. I should have had a picture of Fanon here. Comes from Algeria. If I had been around, I would have been there. And this Sekou Touré from Guinea is there. And who knows who else? A lot of luminaries. And they sat and talked for days about how we would liberate Africa. And this is under the auspices of Nkrumah, under the inspiration of Marcus Garvey. At independence in Ghana, March 6, 1957, what he said, all people of African descent, whether they live in North or South America, the Caribbean or any part of the world are Africans and belong to the African nation. And his statue in um, Accra, Ghana. Here he is in 1963 with his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, Conquering Lion of Judah, at the founding of the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa, May 1963. And he said, I am not African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. Those are wise words. And this is where he is buried. Another Garveyite, somebody who is in this whole mix, is the great John Henry Clark, who I got a chance to spend time with personally. One of the great honors of my life was hanging out with John Henry Clark and being held in high esteem by him. He is one of our greatest scholars and race men. Dr. Clark was the sort of person he could just be somewhere and sit down, old blind man, and start to talk and a crowd would gather. And you would consider yourself lucky to have sat at his feet and had the opportunity to listen to those pearls of wisdom. And I knew him, I was able to introduce him a portrait of him in the Du Bois Center in Accra, wise one. And of course, he was tight with Yosef Ben Yakinen, Dr. Ben. And you have this picture, which I call the quartet. You have here John Henry Clark, you have Chancellor Williams, a Garveyite scholar in my mind, off the destruction of black civilization, Yosef Ben Yakinen, and John G. Jackson. That's, that picture was taken by Charles Agi Ogborn. I call it the quartet. And then we'll call him a grandson of Garvey. This is Stokely Carmichael, who changed his name to Kwame Turek. He was my great teacher before I became a historian, before I met Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, before I met Singor Baye L. I knew Stokely Carmichael. And he changed his name to Kwame Ture. Somewhere right now, He's saying, ready for the revolution, organize, organize, organize. He said, now black people in America are Africans. That's all we are. This is pure Garvey talking. Now black people in America are Africans. That's all we are. We may not want to admit we're Africans, but we cannot deny we came from Africa. And if you're ashamed of your home, you have problems. If you're ashamed of your background, we, you have problems. We're Africans. All right. He would say, and I think he would quote Malcolm X, just because a cat has babies in an oven, you don't call the babies biscuits. Here's a nice poster with Malcolm here and Kwame in the background reading Malcolm X Speaks. And Tony Martin. I spend quality time with Tony, but we don't have a photograph together. So I had to download a photograph or upload it, whatever the terminology was, the Garveyite Scholar Par Excellence. This brother lived and breathed Garvey, and just brilliant, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, who left us far too soon. And Chancellor Williams, Destruction of Black Civilization, nice picture with Billie Holiday. Some of the leaders that Garvey influenced, here I am, about four years ago, standing in between two former prime ministers of Namibia, Garvey, for whatever reason, was big in Southwest Africa, now Namibia. And of course, Robert Mugabe, certainly influenced by the Garvey philosophy. I took this picture on my last trip to Zimbabwe. Tomas Sankara from Burkina Faso, the land of the tall standing men. 
And I must give the rosters credit, the roster parties, because they kept alive the memory of Garvey when it wasn't popular to do so. Now everybody talking about Garvey. Marcus Garvey, like we knew him and hung out with him, et cetera, et cetera. It's like people talk about Martin Luther King and the dream. But the Rastafarians kept alive the memory of Marcus Mosiah Garvey when it wasn't popular to do it. What else did the Rastas do? Healthy diet. It's okay to wear natural hair. So I give the Rastafarians a lot of credit. Like Muda Baruka, who has a song, Garvey, Garvey, Rise Again. Let me just take a sip of water. I think I can say the Muta and I are good friends. And I'm not much of a fan, but I must confess, this is a brother that I wanted to meet. We attended a conference, Muta, myself, Julius Garvey, and this brother in um, the Gambia and Banjul, in 2015, this was Sizzla. And he was treated like a real, real, real celebrity. And he treated me like a, a king. So these are just images showing the Rastafarian influence. And some of my favorite Garvey people, I guess you recognize the tall brother there with the cap next to me. Most people are tall. This is in Martinique. And Uganda. Here, I was, I did a lecture tour. I think it might've been one of my last trips to Uganda that was sponsored by the Marcus Garvey Pan-African Institute of Uganda in the heart of Africa. And in St. Anne's Bay was one of the direct descendants of Marcus Garvey. Look at the resemblance. It looks like his brother just was just taken off the ship. This, this, these are posters from the program I was telling you about in the Gambia with Muta Baruka and Julius Garvey, waiting for the president of the Gambia to come and embrace us. This was taken at the Roots, not Roots, uh, the, the program sponsored by the Institute of Climate Guidance, my brother Tony Browder's organization, and there's Baba Singor, and there's W. Paul Coates, the publisher of Black Classic Press in the center. Last year, was one of the descendants of Edward Wilmot Blyden. The great Zama Cook is here, and that's Brother Kaba Khomeini there. This is an old photograph with Aza Hilliard and his wife, Patsy Joe Hilliard, and there I am in the corner. We're in Limon, Costa Rica, and this was a Liberty Hall in Costa Rica. Bobby was big there. This is a, just a photograph as I wind down from um, taken in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, French Somalia. And I went there about two years ago. And when I was leaving the airport, I didn't know anybody. I was by myself. And I had a, a, a T-shirt with a picture of Marcus Garvey. I'm in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. And I'm going through the airport, going through customs. And one of the officials says, uh, is that Marcus Garvey? <laughs> And I said, yeah, I started laughing. He said, why are you laughing? I said, it's shocking to me that someone would recognize Marcus Garvey in the Horn. He said, brother, who do you think we are? And we got a big laugh out of that. This is in Djibouti. And at the last UNIA conference or convention, I think that I attended, uh, Zama took this nice picture of Marimba Ani. And, I, and one more in the center with Baba Akili and Brother Singor. And I'll just close it out. My daughter is named after Asada Garvey, I mean, after Marcus Garvey. A photograph in the Marcus Garvey Library in Tottenham, in Tottenham, England. One of the best books on Garvey, sorry about the small size, Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa. The book edited by Amy Jakes Garvey, which now has a new edition with an introduction by Julius Garvey, Garvey and Garveyism. And then there's philosophy, selected writings of Marcus Garvey with these children. Now what I'd like to do with your permission is take about 15 more minutes and show you areas where Garvey had an impact, or I just want to emphasize as the logical extensions of Garveyism. I'll do it very quickly. India is important because it has the largest concentration of black people in any one country on earth. And so let me just show you a few images from there. Garvey is the first person 
that I know of to draw attention to the black presence in India. Let me read another passage from his book. He said, when we speak of 400 million Negroes, we mean to include several of the millions of India who are the direct offspring of the of that ancient African stock that once invaded Asia. Okay? So let me show you some of those black folk. Now, these are the pictures. Zama sent me these. These are people called Tamils. And Zama, Singor, and a brother named Tim were invited to participate in a world conference of Tamils in Alexandria, Virginia. I was the only non-Tamil keynote speaker that they've had, at least at that point. In India in 1987, with the Kerala Dalit Panthers who named themselves after the Black Panther Party. All these are in India. Just last Sunday, I did a big Zoom presentation with some Dalits or untouchables in India. That's a big thing. And these are the sisters and brothers that I am talking about. These people are called tribals, Adivasis, Dalits, untouchables. Garvey, before he was railroaded, had plans, according to indigenous Australians who have given me this information, to come to Australia and meet with the indigenous Australians. And there was a Garveyite organization established in Australia among the indigenous people, I believe in the 1930s. So here's a couple of newspaper clippings. Black Power saluted. Aboriginal rights leader declares war on whites. Aboriginal set up militant Black Panther movement. Now, a lot of that springs from Garvey. And so these are sisters and brothers in Australia. Their colors are red, gold, and black. Black for the people, gold for the sun, and red for the land because they say the, the uh, land is drenched with their blood. So all from down under and my visits there. These are great photographs. In the South Pacific, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with two areas that seem ripe for Garveyism, that Garvey, to my knowledge, didn't get to, but they're ripe for the picking. First is the South Pacific. And one of the reasons I say that is because these sisters and brothers say they come from Africa. They will fight you about it. You don't have to argue with them. You don't have to have a scholarly debate. They say they come from Africa and ask you, where do you come from? So these are some of my images from the South Pacific in Fiji, Mbuka Island, and Bougainville. There I am with Julius Garvey and a brother named Benny Winda, who is the paramount chief of the Donnie people in West Papua. This was his first trip to Africa. And so there we are together, all South Pacific Islanders. If he is not killed, he would be the leader of, Papua, of West Papua when it becomes independent. And finally, one other area that to me has never really been looked at from the perspective of Pan-Africanism or Garveyism, and this is the black presence in what is traditionally called the Middle East in North Africa and West Asia. So let me just show you a few images just to put it on your mind. In Palestine, Iraq, there's a significant section or segment of African people in Southern Iraq. Palestine, Oman, Jordan, 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 Tunisia, back in Africa. So even in Northern Africa, black people are oppressed, in Tunisia particularly so. And this is in the southern part of Tunisia. And finally, just a few things to close out. Our ancestors paid a tremendous price for us to be able to speak out against injustice. We don't have the right to be silent. You, you don't have, that's a luxury. You can't say this is not important to me, that I'm just going to ride it out. It doesn't affect me directly. I'm going to look the other way. Our ancestors paid a tremendous price for us to be able to speak out against injustice. We don't have the right to be silent, even when it's difficult, even when it's a challenge, even when we are alone. We don't have the right to keep our mouth closed, keep our mouth shut. And black is beautiful. We all agree with that. 
being black and powerful will be even better. Let's work for that. Our history did not begin in chains and it will not end in chains. Garvey personified all of these things. And so in many ways, I would say Marcus Garvey is live. He's alive in us. I say, I say, because I say. His ideas are alive in us. And as long as we keep the ideas alive, he is alive. The vision is alive. The past is not finished and history is not dead. And then finally, the last photograph of Marcus Garvey. Apparently it was popular at that time. It was a trend to photograph people in their coffins. And so I wonder what would Garvey say to us today? Would he be happy? Would he say, y'all have really done some serious work. I'm proud of you. Or will he say, y'all are some trifling, be about nothing Negroes. What will Garvey say? What are we going to say when we face the ancestors? What will our statement in life be? Will they give us a pass? Will they say, well done, my sister. Well done, my brother. That's what we are aiming for. Everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And I think that we have to look within and ask ourselves, what is our contribution? How will we be perceived by future generations? So sisters and brothers, that's what I wanted to share with you. I hope you were able to benefit from it. I enjoyed it. I'm learning how to work Zoom and WebEx, but it seems to have much, much potential. I was reluctant to give this presentation, but when Singor talked talk to me about it and he said, Brother Keely asked about you, how am I going to say no to that? So I was really, really pleased. And uh, just thank you for the honor of invoking the life and times and memory of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Gavi. I share. Sure. Sure. Great, great presentation, Brother Renoko. I say, uh, I say, uh, Brother Renoko, uh, the you showed a picture of Garvey and the two brothers that were standing there, one in the white yeah. suit. Yes. Okay, from my studies, those are the two men that Garvey recruited for the UNIA in in 1917, like mid 1917. I don't have my script with me at the moment to give you their names, and those are the same two brothers that. Once he, because he stepped off to and created the UNIA Inc. in 1918, but okay. he entrusted them. So that was his lesson on trust. He then returned to remove them from that UNIA as the UNIA continued. And then he continued to grow the UNIA that he originally started. And then in 1920, the UNIA became UNIA ACL. All right. I think one of them was from Benin. Yes, sir. Now, what else did I say that needs to be corrected or revived? Revised. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. I want to be accurate. I get a lot of information, and I'm sure I might have erred on some of the details. Not air, brother, but the thick picture you have of um, the Honorable uh, Marcus Garvey in his uh, casket. That's yeah. an African thing. They still do it. Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, we learned that today. Uh, also, in in where his coffin is in Jamaica, I happen to have been there when they enshrined it. It is in an upright position so that Garvey is not laying down but standing up. Oh, okay. Right. That's right. Uh, Baba Renoko, you did such an excellent presentation. Yes, you did. Always do. But, uh, you know, I got a question for you. First of all, <laughs> You, you demonstrated clearly why you are our traveling ambassador. In your travels, uh, you, you laid out a, quite a bit about uh, the connection historically of not only Garveyism, but race first and race uh, first and race first women and men. But in your recent travels, how much, how much, how much would you say Garvey is known? known as some of the places on the continent that you've traveled today. I mean, you know, in the last 20, there's about 15, 20 years in terms of relevancy of Garvey's legacy and not just his name, but his work. I'm not sure if there's a place where he's not. For example, Ethiopia, uh, Senegal. Uh, I've never been to Liberia. I would imagine there. Oh, yeah, well, but Garvey is... Is live and well. Garvey laid the the blueprint. To me, Garvey and Nkrumah are the two great figures in the modern history of Pan Africanism in terms of having the greatest impact or influence. I don't think that anybody overshadows Garvey and um, 
and Nkrumah. Now, one thing about Garvey, and I'm going to say this, this may make some people mad. I don't know. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> I think that we have a tendency to, how do I say it? Take away the humanity of a lot of our, our leaders. What do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. We love them so much that we put them on pedestals as yeah. though they are not really human. They don't have emotions and feelings. They don't get scared. They don't get frustrated. And none of the, I would imagine Mark Carey Tubman must have been scared sometimes. I would imagine that. I would imagine Malcolm might have said from time to time, is it worth it? I would think Garvey must have said every now and then, later for these Negroes. But what made them so great to me is that in spite of their humanness, they kept going. And that to me really elevates them on a much even higher level. And and to if I may, in, in veggie backing off your comment, I think you're hundred percent correct. We have a tendency to want perfection. Yes. But what Garvey was demanding of us was perfection. So we didn't want to see imperfection. But Garvey was human. Garvey really understood understood us what, what we have to do is understand Marcus Garvey and if you understand Marcus Garvey then you understand the positions that he took well because he was willing to make the sacrifice but at the same time he also recognized that it took economics to move forward and therefore he worked to do that he didn't work to be a poor Negro leader he worked to make sure that he could build wealth and that's right to build wealth and move us forward because that was essential you couldn't want to take on the world and demand that you build an army and a navy and figure that you could do that with pennies. You have to do that with the foresight, and therefore he did. That's what made him not only powerful to us, that's what made him a threat to those men and women of that time. Yeah. Because he was committed. Not He wasn't perfect, but he was committed. And with that commitment that he brought forth, it is what laid the foundation for the things we face that we have today is why we have to have a hundred year and a 500 year plan because that's the image. But I will say to the answer to your question, what would the ancestors say for us right now? They're going to say, you got work to do. Hopefully let when me, we meet them, they say we did. Okay. Let me add a, a few other things that come to mind. First, it's good to see Dr. Horn, the good brother, David Horn, another one of my mentors. Uh, one thing about yeah, seriously, I'm not saying that to be funny. David Horn no, really, I, 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 really had a big influence on me. A couple, three things. One, joke, side joke. Garvey, I'm told, uh, I don't know if it was Singwood told me this or Julius Garvey, that Garvey was a stickler for time. Yes. Garvey would not allow time to be wasted. He liked to start on time. Yes. Uh, Garvey had an, a publication. I should have mentioned this too. After the Negro World called the Black Man. Yes. That's an important point. Yeah. So those are some other things that just, just occurred to me. You know, when I'm doing a presentation, it's sometimes difficult to cover everything because I'm so visual. So, for example, I would have liked to have had a picture of David Walker, mm -hmm. ah. David Walker author of The Appeal, who comes yeah. around yeah. the same time as Henry Highland Garnett, who called for the abolition of slavery and also talked about Nile Valley civilization being the fruit of Africa. But because I don't have an image of David Walker, I find myself inadvertently leaving people out who should have been included in the roll call. Yeah. But, but your roll call was excellent. I mean, you, you even brought names back that I had not thought about for a minute because we have to understand Garvey was a part of the movement, but for us, he became the movement. But you mentioned Edward Blyden. You mentioned yeah. men and women that, that were the nanny from the Maroons. I mean, when people of our race really want to try to kind of grapple with who we are, you have to embrace your history. You know who else could have been mentioned? It. And that's George Padmore. Yes, sir. The author of right. Pan-Africanism or Communism. Right. Because, you know, a lot of people were communists at that time. They saw the Bolshevik Revolution and they saw hope with that. Yeah. And then when Ethiopia was invaded and the Soviet Union did not intervene, a lot of communist brothers and sisters were disillusioned and that moved them towards Pan-Africanism. John Henry Clark and George Padmore were in that category. Correct. Correct. And George Padmore was excellent, even in his writing. I've been fortunate to have opportunity to read much of what he put together. Uh, and in your presentation, more than excellent, it was thought-provoking. 
And whenever you have a, a lecture that thoughts provoking and it moves you to this kind of conversation, <laughs> it is not only good, it's great. And that speaks to what you bring to the table. You bring the thoughts up. That's so what you do. Let us hear. Let us hear from some of the uh, other folks on the line. Yeah. Brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm calling on any sister now. Just speak out. I know you have something to say, if not a question, a comment, or something to say to Renoko. So don't all of y'all, you know, roll at one time. Uh, somebody open up their mic and speak, please. Before they do that, let's let's just one one comment real quick. Let's hold it for a second. One second. I want us to uh, give our brother. Zama, oh, absolutely. Some kudos and acknowledgments for handling the technical aspect of it. Well yeah. done, my brother. We appreciate you, man. the communications, and he also is our one of our well, our strongest warrior in the trenches who keeps everybody moving and popping and cleaning. Okay. And he does all of our prop. And uh, Baba Mosi and Zama both handle communications and information. Wonderful. And you know, it's and we all we all see ourselves as brothers, but you know, Renoko, we really are appreciative of you. Uh, not only the work you do along with uh, us and the UNIA, but the work you do for the race, the sacrifices you made, and the fact that you're sitting still right, still working out to push the information. So I'm calling on the Queen one at a time now. I don't know everybody pop yes. at the same time. Come on. Okay, I'll go first, Brother Renoka. Thank you too. Okay, yes. Brother Renoka. For um, David Walker, just stick up the front of his book since we don't have a picture of it to include it. Okay. That, that in it because I think okay. also and the importance of his book uh, mm -hmm. cannot be denied. Okay. okay. And, yes. Good so, point. Yes. Yeah, so I think that, that you might be able uh, to, to do that. I think that the other thing I would uh, only ch charge us with is while we are making um, Marcus Garvey basically our messiah, let's keep our eyes on his vision that our responsibility is to bring his vision into fruition into very good that's very good and, and you know before the next sister speaks I, you, thank you today that's right on point because uh Renoko mentioned the black man magazine all of the black man magazine articles were designed in rebuilding the 1920s high times of the unia because we're talking about the 1930s prior to Garvey's elevation. And when we, Rehabilitating Committee to us was first established by Marcus Garvey. And what we mean by that, that's important. And then later on, Thomas W. Harvey. But a lot of the things in the Black Man Magazine will show us a, a more holistic Garvey and point more to what we need to be about doing going forward with this next hundred years. So I just wanted to throw that in there, Renoko, because uh, later on came the Garvey's voice. And that came later on under Thomas W. Harvey and the same thing applied and we go forward. Here we are today building now for the next hundred years. But anyway. No, 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 let me, let me be clear now. I wanna ask a question. So Garvey's voice comes after Garvey. After the Negro world. After yes. the Negro world, yes. The Garvey's voice came under the leadership of Thomas W. Harvey. Right. And Thomas W. Harvey was the successor of Marcus Garvey. Absolutely. Yes. And, and most, respo most responsible president general for, okay. for, the, for the moving forward of the years after Garvey. He okay. all, and, and in the, the Black Man magazine, Thomas W. Harvey and Charles L. James are two of the most popular names all throughout the time once the, once Garvey was returned to Jamaica and moved to the uh to the to, to London. Some of them are even more so than Charles L. James. But both of them are mentioned all in throughout that. And there are other names. But the point is it was not just about Garvey. It was about those people who stayed committed to Garvey and why the UNIA continued to stay alive when Garvey himself came under attack, <laughs> around, envelope around the Black Star Line and was one out of the United States. But the okay. ACL always stayed intact because of a choice few of committed students of Garvey. Now, yeah. we're not saying that everybody wasn't, but a whole lot of people went all kinds of ways and Black Man Magazine has demonstrated. Now, of course, Garvey was continuously attacked after he was pushed out of the United States all the way up to his death. See that, see, see, so he was constantly under pressure 
once he was pushed out of the United States and even while he was in the UK for five years. So we need to take that into account. But he taught the course of African philosophy to key people who kept the sustainability all the way to where we are today. And we're blessed to be some of the people who were able to touch those brothers who were touched and sisters who were touched by Garvey and passed it on. That's why I President General, you gotta go to Kiwi. That's why it's our responsibility. See, we don't want our grandchildren to say what you said, Renoko. We want them to say, Baba Singo, Baba Kili did everything they took, could to continue the legacy works, words, and deeds and move forward. Mary Boat, et cetera. So, uh, Baba Kili, please respond okay. a little bit to that. Please. Just, just a little. Um, he mentioned Thomas W. Harvey. And he mentioned Harvey because of the Rehabilitating Committee in 1942. So let's try to put just a little put in perspective. When Garvey was deported from the U.S. to Jamaica, he was also in prison. And then once he was released from prison and he attempted to organize, he knew and realized he couldn't do it there. He went to England and then he reached out to those who were one, a part of Garvey clubs. Because Garvey Clubs, because the UNIA in, Philly, in America at that time, there was the UNIA, there was the UNIA Inc. So two entities was functioning. The UNIA in and of itself, which is what Garvey had left, it was a business that he could not go back to. The men and women that supported him became his students. Charles L. James, Thomas W. Harvey, Sister Isaac, and a, and a, a few others. So from that legacy in 1940, at his death, the... President General was elected was Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart put out his mission to move the the, the parent body to Africa. Mr. Harvey disagreed with that and also recognized that the Garvey family needed to be a priority, which was a part of the breakup of the organization at that time. So from 1942, that's when they established it, but in 1948 was when there was a separation. The, the justification is not to justify what we're doing, but it is to show the history as you do. And if you understand the history, you recognize that there were men and women that followed Garvey that stayed true to the mission because there was no in-house fighting, even with separation. Okay. Thank you. I, I, thank you. Now, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, Mary, do you have anything you wanted to ask for no call? Uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to say to Dr. <coughs> thanks for your presentation and thank you especially for including uh, women in your presentation. Um, and I just wanted to also tell you that uh, in Detroit, uh, Mr. Elijah Poole, yeah, Muhammad was a member of Detroit Division 407. Okay, and being the president of that division, he was his captain, so he knew that, and that was that's historical fact. So it's not you know a myth or you know any confusion. There, it's been it was documented that. Elijah Poole was a member of Division 407. In Detroit. In Detroit. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, any, any other sisters that want to come on now, please? Oh. Let me let me ask Mary uh, another question. Anybody else can respond to it? Sure. Are there women who I should have included and did not? Oh, Henrietta Vinton Davis. In there. Henrietta Vinton Davis. Lady Lena. Henrietta Vinton Davis, Lady Demina, Honorable uh, Estelle James. Oh, it's yeah. a whole, it's no way possible for you to have included everybody, everybody. but it was, it was so many people. Uh, and the reason I say Estelle James, so people know that was Honorable Charles L. James. She was a living legend like Queen Mother Moore. She knew yep. every president general all the way up to me and yeah. served under all of them up to me, uh, including Marcus Garvey and was a Black Cross nurse when she was in her teenage years in New Orleans. So, they, But we love Queen Mother Moore. You didn't mention Queen Mother Moore. But I never do, I never thought of Queen Mother Moore as a Garveyite. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 had, I sat on her, I sat at her feet and, and learned that. But also Alma Golden, who oh, uh, yes. was uh, in the UNIA when she was yeah. like five years old. Uh, yes. At our transition, we had opportunity yes, to like see a picture of her when she yes. was five years old in uniform. Um, it isn't so much who you miss. What 
the beauty is all those that you named. Because right. what you showed was Garvey didn't come in a vacuum. A lot of times we want to think that. Garvey followed the voices. Af Af up up Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. You, you demonstrated Africa for the Africans was something that Garvey picked up and realized, hey, I can add to that, those at home and those abroad. We showed that there was a, a, a movement that yes. was in, 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 in the world. They, it wasn't all connected, at least seemingly not, but you showed the connections because Great from work. different years, different centuries, different times, you showed the continuation. And, 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 for me, and for me, that suggests that we have the responsibility to be the next level of continuation because from where you started and then 100 years of, of, of the UNIA, 133 at Garvey, but 100 years of the UNIA, you showed tonight almost three, 400 years of history showing the links of Pan-Africanism and the movement that Garvey became the our particular leader of because there were men and women that stood up and said, no, this shit ain't right. But of all the women that you mentioned, yes. Henrietta Vinton Davis is the one who stands at the top. Well, yeah, possibly. I, I would say possibly. She, she spent a lot of time, was very loyal to Garvey early on, but so was uh, Amy Ashwood Garvey, I mean, Amy Jocks Garvey, and so was uh, Lady Domina, who was the right arm sister to Henrietta Vinton Davis. And there were names that we don't even remember. See, one, one key thing we got to understand is there would be no legacy without the African women of the right. UNIA. Absolutely. There would be no legacy, Renoko, without. So it's more African women who were powerful than African men. And and nine times out of ten, most of the men that you run into, there was an African woman there with that man. But it's one brother you mentioned that was very close to me, who I sat at his feet, and I saw he, I see him as a major reason I'm where I'm at, and that's Dr. Tony Martin. Dr. Yeah. Martin corrected all of the incorrect historical misdirection of what people wanted us to be it's thinking right. about Garvey, and he said everything straight. That's why Honorable Charles L. James and Thomas W. Harvey commissioned him to be the official historian for the government. And what he showed us is where the UNIA is a government. He demonstrated to that, that to us historically as late as Brother Battle's tenure, which was yep. in the, you know, so what I'm saying is, Renoko, he, Dr. Tony Martin, should go down like Dr. John Henry Clark as being two major brothers that, and that they are standing for. But here it is, universal Pan-African nationalism. Garveyism mm -hmm. only became Garveyism because of Garvey's name. So we say Garveyism, but it's true, like you said. Universal African nationalism. There so many people that came before Garvey who yeah. was race men and race women that Garvey was continuing on their work. Garvey just happened to travel around the world and didn't see the man of big affairs. He didn't now, see the man. You know, another person that I took out, I had a photograph of him, but the photo was very small. Of course, it's Deuce Muhammad Ali. Yes. Uh, yeah, the yeah, African Times and Orient Review was another very important figure. Yeah, even the Honorable yes. Elijah Muhammad, even the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would have been an important figure as well because he was a student of, of the he UNIA. Okay, so it, I may, it. may have missed it, but the reason yeah, that's that important, one. but yeah, and the reason that's important is because Muslims don't want to recognize that, yeah, but it's no. historical fact. And I happened to have had the Minister of Farrakhan tap me on the back when I told him I was first Assistant President General and say to me, my father, was a part of that movement. So I don't care what they say. Wow. The minister said my father was a Baba, part of that movement. Baba Kili, you're absolutely on point. At the same time, historically, we gotta we gotta talk about Leonard P. Howe. You mentioned the Rastafari movement, mm -hmm. but Leonard P. Howe came directly out of the Garvey movement, and Leonard Howe kind of uh, was instrumental, not creating Rastafari, but he helped develop the philosophy of Rastafari, which came out of Garveyism and Buddhism. And, okay. and that's historically been proven as a fact. So there's a tremendous amount of personalities that are were, were affected by Garth. Uh, another sister, any other sisters want to speak? Well, it's open. Baba Mosi, anybody that want to share, come come on. We want to have this open. We want everybody to get an opportunity. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I just decided to 
come in and say hello. <laughs> I have just been sitting here enjoying uh, Renoko and things are all of y'all. <laughs> Good to see you, my sister. Yeah. Deborah, Deborah Watkins is um, kind of like an angel in no. the movement and to me. She's very, very, very supportive of me. Uh, kind of like a modern, who's the daughter of C.J. Walker? She would hold these salons in Harlem and invite, that's how Deborah is. Just a really wonderful sister that I cannot I say enough that. good things about. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you're able to make it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it is just um, it is so exciting to sit here and listen to y'all. I've been a Garveyite since 1973. Whoa. Right. And uh, I was an undergraduate uh, and did a paper, a comparison contrast paper uh, between Marcus Garvey and W.B. Du Bois. And I came out on the Garvey side. And I have been a fan of Marcus Garvey ever since. And I don't know if y'all know that Paul Coates just um, uh, uh, published or, or ju just republished some of Tony Martin's books, uh, Dr. Martin's books. And I bought $100 worth of them um, because, you know, I just that's he's the original source. Dr. Martin is, is somebody pointed out, I think Zangor said, he is the original, you know, he's the original scholar when it comes to Marcus Garvey. And so I wanted to have Dr. Martin's books. So I was happy to buy them from Paul Coates uh, and Black Classic Press because we need to support our Black businesses. Um, so anyway, yeah, I say. So the, thank you for sharing that. We talk about uh, Paul Coates' work all the time, but it certainly Zama could put the book up and show you that uh, we definitely own it. In fact, Zama Cook did the cover. Brother Zama, uh, Sister Watkins was just talking about Race First, the book that's out now by Paul Coates. Uh, our, our Minister of Information did the cover. And the reason I say that is because it's the same as the original Race First. And we see Race First almost like a Bible to not, mm -hmm. only, not only the history of the UNIA, but Tony had a way about, we call him the cool ruler. Mm. Tony super cool, but right on it, to, down to the wire. He actually sat at the feet of some of the people that walk with Garvey. Uh, and he incubated in Detroit with many of them. And that book that was done in 1976 is not just about Garvey, it's about the whole history of the UNIACL. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a whole legacy of books that Tony Martin had. Singer, singer, singer. Let me, let me interject here. First, I, I'd almost forgotten. I was able to spend time with Tony Martin in Trinidad and also Australia. But here's a question for everybody. I wonder what Garvey would say about the recent struggles for racial justice in the United States and Black Lives Matter. What do you think Garvey would say about these young people who've taken to the streets? Well, a lot of that our conference. I'm on CD. Want to to that? What would Garvey say? I heard you. What would Garvey say yeah. to to that activity? Gar Garvey, you called him conservative, but I say Garvey was more of a tactician, and I think he would look at the taking it to the streets and destroying the property as an as a negative act because he would tell you build so that you don't have to face that because you need to build your own governmental structures and if we had done that we would not face that type of oppression because the government of the UN of the Negro people of the world will be speaking to it so I think he would challenge that type of behavior because of his of his beliefs that there was a, ne a necessary movement in order to correct it. Now, what, it would, what would he say about voting? Yeah. What would he say about Kamala Harris? Would he advocate <laughs> that we should be, I don't you know, would he advocate that See, we should be registering to vote? I, I, I know. Uh, because, because in the course that Gagari laid out and he was teaching, he talked about us making sure we utilize the government activities that were un that uh, that we were under so i think he would support the voting and i think he would say to us we need to look to see which west serves us because he always wanted to make sure that if the, our government couldn't provide for us then the government that we were under needed to provide for us yeah. and that i'm saying now brother Akili, you showed your little grandbabies and i'm saying <laughs> the sad part is is that you know 
where we are and where we live, we are immediately impacted by that government. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, That's what Garvey said. Yes. To make sure that we get out there and do what we have to do to protect our children. Right. The second right. thing is now you know me, I'm gonna always come on the side of the of the of the youth. <laughs> And I had said, we need to utilize, because of the Black Lives Matter movement is not the negativity tearing it all up. That's the other folk who are trying to destroy what it is that they are trying right. to do in the back as they infiltrate everything that we do. Mm -hmm. My point was, they carry the red, black, and green flag and may not know what it is. So it is our opportunity to teach and to bring them into the fold of greater understanding so that they can go on. They are the they are the energy we had back in the day. And and we were the rebels. So they are it now. So we need to give them the energy and the wisdom to be able to move forward. And and ten, and, and Tendai, you pointed out uh the some of the negativity, but my response to the question wasn't directed at black people wanting justice and change it was wanted at the negativity that came from it which put the dim light on it because when garvey said in the course of african philosophy if you are in need you need to go to the government that's supposed to provide it so you're absolutely correct that we have to address that and you also correct that when we were out and i'll use the the, the garvey movement in and of itself garvey didn't profess that we break the law what he professed was that we stand above the law and be the righteous conscious man and woman in order to move ourselves in a better position to address it. So even those rebels that were a part of our movement, Garvey wanted to make sure that we stood correctly so that when we challenged and built our own, we can make sure we do what we got to do. So you're right. And yes, my granddaughter is, a, is part of the reason why I got to do what I got to do. We have, uh, we have somebody here who is in the this, this struggle to clear Garvey's name. This <laughs> is Nikichi Taifa, and I think she's been raising her hands, perhaps to to uh, make a uh, statement. So, uh, if, if go, ahead. Permission, maybe she can... go ahead, Bob. go ahead, Sister Nikichi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I I tuned in late. Apologies. Um, for Stephen, it showed up and starting at ten thirty tonight on my schedule, but whatever. Um, I think Garvey would be looking around today and wondering. Have we really <laughs> I think it would be how do we go from black pride and culture and red, black and green and do for self and black power to just being able to say, I just want to breathe. So I think probably we want to, you know, how much progress you know has been made when the valley cry today is just for our lives just to matter. I mean, you know, I think that's that's some analysis there. You know, Garvey was famous for saying one of the things I love about him the most, and I think I have it right. How did you come to form the organ, the UNINACL? He said, I looked around for the black man's army, his navy, his men of big affairs, and I could not find them, so I decided to upgrade. I wonder how much that has really changed. Who can we say in the world today speaks for African people? I mean, can you name a single individual on an international scale? You know what I'm saying? Nope. Nope. Where is where is David Horn? Before I say another word, where is yeah. David Horn? David, please, uh, Renoko been talking about you. I'm positive. Yeah, you, you, since you was his elder, you know. Come on. I think his microphone is muted. Yeah, unmute yourself, Dr. Horn. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello, in case you how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing, my brother? Hey, we're going to get this reparations thing down. We got to deal with ADOS, though. ADOS is <laughs> taking up way too much space. So the, um, a quick comment going back to a question that you had asked um, Rashidi about the importance of Garvey and Garveyism on the continent. Mm -hmm. I can safely tell you that out of the 55 countries, there are a minimum of 40 of those countries that they easily recognize Garvey's name, 
and you and the UNIA. Every meeting that I attended on the continent, Garvey's name came up. Uh, Garvey and Garveyism's uh, presence came up. The in in front of the African Union building, they have this statue of Kwame Nkrumah. You know, be, being being who Osage Ufo was. They have recently put a companion statue of Haile Selassie ne next to Kwame Nkrumah. I think part of what we have to work on is getting a statue of Marcus Garvey to be there with those other two. <laughs> and, and the African Union, we're willing to do it as long as we're willing to pay for it. I say. But, but Garvey and Garveyism on the continent may be bigger there than it is here. Mm -hmm. All right. Now. You don't recognize. Okay. And so that's that's my re that I pulled on David. So the response to your question is what he gave you because I don't know that in the world today there is a single person. But I do recognize there are collective voices that are addressing race groups. There are collective voices addressing race groups. So All right. the, whole, the, whole point about, the whole point about conference has been. You know, building for the next hundred years, Renoko, and without giving up a lot of what we have uh, accomplished, and we've accomplished a lot in these few days, is about connecting with brothers and sisters of uh, who 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 don't know what we all have learned and studied about the UNIA, and connecting with them. It does not mean just recruiting UNIA members, but it means connecting with other entities as well uh, on the continent uh, and in fact around the world. So the good news is. We're not asleep, and we are clear that Garvey would not be happy with us. And, and <laughs> thank you so much about what you what you said because it is a fact. Garvey, Malcolm, and Krumah, none of those ancestors are happy with where we are, and we should be ashamed of ourselves to some extent for the apathy that even the conscious community has shown. However, those of us that are woke are serious about our children and going forward. So we're we're part of the legacy of the ancestors of not just Garvey, but all of those that you presented up on the screen because many of their, their contributions have to be emulated. They might not, we can't wear their shoes and we can't find a single leader, but certainly cooperatively like brother David, Dr. Horn just said, if 40 countries at least know the name of Garvey and the UNIA, our job now is not only for the name just to be known, but to put the structure out there of the works of the consolidation of Africans at home and abroad, and we can do that. Garvey also warned us, <coughs> we did not pick up that mantle of moving forward that we would actually be exterminated. And we are seeing some of that today. That's a hard, I mean, I just gotta call it like it is, uh, you know, and so, but our job is to change that paradigm uh, and not just for ourselves, but for the next hundred years. And like our PG says, even the next 500 years. So Renuko, talk to us a little more about uh, your experiences because you shared so much with me. I mean, I see you as a uh, uh, places that I'll never get to go to. You have actually given that energy back to us. You turned me on to a book, Booker T. Washington did, but you said something from the movie it gave to you. <coughs> what is no, the, book, the, book wasn't on, the book wasn't by Booker T. But no, the book no. was about Booker T. Right, 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 right. Yeah, by Booker T. But the point is, how is Namibia? Oh. Didn't they just name a, a, a street after Garvey or, or, or something like that? In the yeah, Midwest? yeah. I think those are good things, but to me, they're more symbolic. Yeah. Okay. yeah I'm drawn more to substance, you know. So I, I, I agree with Bob Akili. We just have a tremendous amount of work to do. And the idea of being looking at things from a long-term perspective. I think, yeah, we need a 100-year plan and a 500-year plan, but we also need a one-day plan, a one-week plan, a one-month plan. We need the whole range of things. And, 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 and one of the 
you know, I'm getting older now and people look at me like an elder and they ask me questions. I've been in the movement for a long time. And some of the lessons that I've learned are the lessons that we all know. And that is no matter how hard you work, you're not gonna change it by yourself. You must be organized. You can't do it by yourself. So no matter how hard you work, even with an organization, chances are it's gonna take time. The situation we find ourselves in didn't start yesterday and it's not gonna end tomorrow. So we must structure ourselves to be in a generational fight because otherwise you get frustrated, you say it's not worth it, and then you become part of the problem. And I can see, and we have seen many people who have become part of the problem, become part of what we are actually fighting against. Absolutely, if I may, yeah, please. And if I may, and 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 if there's someone that that needs to speak, I'll stop. It, you're correct. It's not just a hundred year plan, five hundred year plan. We have to lay lay or stand on that. And I say we have to stand on the foundation that Marcus already laid out for us, which is one: as you build military, you can't build military without economics. As you want to raise a a nation, you can't raise a nation without economics. You can't raise a nation without skills. So that we have to look at all of those day to day activities we in a in this country face day to day manslaughter in our community by us on us. We got to face and try to work to eradicate that as well. We got to face work to eradicate the drug use that's been put on us by the system that says if you got a problem take a pill and when you grew up you had a headache they tell you to take a deep breath and you could do that and that could help so yeah we face a real life challenge but in order to manifest this real life challenge we have to look at what our history tells us and our history of Booker T. Washington, who wrote up from slavery, Marcus Messiah Garvey, who gave us the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, as well as Muhammad and the other names that you mentioned, who all gave us pieces that fit under the umbrella and under the teachings and the directions of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. If we apply that knowledge correctly, the job will be well done. Just won't be done fast. Okay. Question. Well, well, sisters and brothers, I really have covered a lot. Uh, of course, I got tens of thousands of photographs, but I think, you know, I've I've done my time, and I hope <laughs> I've been able to make a contribution. Okay, and I turn it over to you all now, Baba. It's on you. Okay. I, I was going to ask a question, but if, if you don't. Oh no! Of course, of course, go for it. No. Yes. Uh, you know we. Um, we have the largest uh, amount of Africans in Latin America. Their, their, their population together is larger than what we have here in the United States. And uh, in your travels in Latin America, dealing with some of these African people in Latin America, uh, what would you say uh, we can do to, um, to change the, the disconnect we have with them to, to sort of communicate more with them and improve our relationship. Is there something that you have seen in any way that uh, we can do that? I think that Africans in America are in the most strategic position of any group. And when I say America, I mean the United States. Are in the most strategic position of any group of Africans in the world. We live in the most powerful country a very, very wealthy, none of us are hungry. All of us got a tablet, we got a laptop, we got a cell phone. We have relative freedom of movement and freedom of speech. You know, I think that the African experience in the United States could be the epicenter, could be the, I don't even know what to call it. You mentioned Africans in Latin America. But I also think of the black struggle that's going on in West Papua right now. There's a liberation struggle going on deep in the South Pacific by black people who call themselves, who say they come from Africa and who are proud of it. And genocide is being committed upon them by Indonesia. African-Americans could speak out against that just like we spoke out of, against apartheid in South Africa. And we can do the same thing with African populations all over the world. And Latin America is no exception. I've never seen anything of substance about Marcus Garvey in Brazil mm -hmm. among that huge population there. Or for that matter, very little about Garvey in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Peru. 
There is a Garveyite uh, movement in Mexico, but a lot of that is driven because there's a Rastafarian community. But it seems to me that African Americans could really be a pivotal source for the advancement of the African Revolution. Our problem, I suppose, is lack of organization, obviously, but also this kind of torn consciousness. We, I think there's, that deep in our hearts, we want to identify with Africa. One of the examples is the movie Black Panther, or this big box office hit, which really surprised me. I went to, I had to be dragged kicking and screaming to go to that movie twice. I'm so antisocial. Two fine sisters in two different cities says, Renoko, you owe me dinner. Take me to this movie. I said, let's go. I saw young African youth with their dashikis on. They may have been made in China, but they were dashikis doing the black, doing the work. They black, <laughs> never use the N word. Young black women as scientists, all of them wearing their natural hair. I think that we want to identify with something bigger than ourselves, something that we can take pride in. And I think that what we have to do is just intensify our level of education. That's why I put so much emphasis on photographs. You see me lecture before, I always do visual with the maxim that seeing is believing and a picture is worth a thousand words. So I think we're doing the right thing. I just think we have to do more of it and we have to intensify it. And we have to realize too, that what we do and don't do has consequences. A lot of us think, I mean, in other words, inaction is perhaps, what am I trying to say? We have to realize that, it, that all of our actions, one way or the other, have an impact. And I think that we could ask ourselves every morning when we get up, what am I going to do or don't do that's going to impact the movement of my people? So I think we need organization. And we just need to do more of what we're doing. And I think that what we're doing tonight is a part of that. Now, this pandemic has been no joke. I mean, I've gone through deep depressions. Most of my income I earned from lectures and doing group tours. Now all that's finished. But I also see great potential in this Zoom and WebEx. So we don't even have to move. It's an excellent storm of communication and it's cheap. So it's like we are the ones we've been waiting for. And we just have to intensify our efforts and, and don't be discouraged and hold on to each other when we have doubts and fears and anxieties and, and aim to please and, and make a statement that our ancestors will be proud of. That's what I think. Thank you, sir. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Yeah, OK. okay. I keep, I keep meeting myself. Listen, um, I think Rashidi is absolutely correct in what he just said. The, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure we don't confuse South America with Latin America, though. They're not the same. Now, elaborate on that. Um, Latin America is where they speak a language that comes out of Latin. South America, uh, okay. like, like like Suriname and other places, no, they don't have a Latin-based language. And 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 uh, Portuguese is not Latin, and that's all of Brazil. But the uh, the other thing in Ecuador, they do know Marcus Garvey. They have uh, Marcus Garvey clubs. I know because when they had the eighth pan-african congress in south africa a few years ago that they, they had an ecuadorian uh delegation and they said they wanted to make sure people understood they were black people and they knew marcus garvey they knew of garvey okay you know you have black folk in all of these countries Right, right. The, the only country in South America I haven't been to is Paraguay. And they have black folk there. There's a myth that all the black folk in Argentina were wiped out. But there are hundreds of thousands of people of African heritage in Argentina today. Same thing in Chile. That's right. That's right. And right. so for many of us, we are just becoming aware of black people in Bolivia. So I still think that African Americans who have access to so much 
technology and information can be in the vanguard. And it's ironic to me that the descendants of people taken out of the door of no return are now in such a pivotal position to shape the future of the entire African world. I believe that. I, I, I agree with you. The, um, a quick, a last quick comment. In uh, 2006, when we started trying to put together a diasporan organization to answer the African Union's invitation, and we started trying to collectivize as many black nationalists in the United States and Canada as we could, it became clear that most of my black nationalism and most of the, the uh, black activism of the people I was around was all directed from here to the Caribbean and from the Caribbean to Africa. We totally, we had totally ignored black people in Honduras, in Nicaragua. Yeah. You know, uh, I never even heard of Martinique. Let, uh, the, <laughs> we had ignored the black folk who were right at our doorstep. And the, uh, you know, because I'm from Florida, I knew about black people in Mexico, but we've had to rearrange our thinking. Gavi is very important in South America and in parts of Latin America, and we need, we need to um, expand on that in terms of our, our work forward. Okay. All right. Think, Anyone else? I think that's what you said, Brother David. Uh, I know when I was in Peru, we asked to see some African folk. And in Peru at the time, it was some time ago, um, the majority of black folk who were there, who they were all in the entertainment industry. That's yeah. all they did. They danced. Right. They, they didn't didn't know until we went to the villages and talked to them that the drums that they were playing were a carbon copy of the foot drum, for example, from from Ghana. They played it that way, but didn't have any idea that's where it came from. Right. Uh, because of what they had been taught in terms of of their history, but their awakening is an awakening that you know that we started going through in terms of our black consciousness in the 60s and 70s um in, in terms of those places there i just wanted to say in, in a last statement that one of the things that as we're talking that it just reminds me of the fact as i used to tell as i have told my students at, at the university the existence of trump is a is an example to tell you that the struggle never ends right Ooh. it will always be there and we must always be vigilant now, sister, what do you mean by that? Once we, I think that we're talking about having achieved something and folk, you know, kind of got complacent and got comfortable and whatever. We thought we had a right. We thought we had gotten somewhere. We thought we had achieved some things, mm -hmm. you know. And so we kind of a little bit let our guard down. And then one of the contingencies, you know, I'm always talking about Garvey reached out to everybody. Because I'm saying there are folks who are within inside. I can't do it, but they can. So I need to be friends with them to get some stuff and get some resources for those of us who, who can't be inside that system to do what we have to do. Right. And so okay. I'm constantly saying we've got to reach out because we're Africans first before we're anything else. And okay. so talking about saving the African world and making sure that we have that communication. My partner here, Michael, just reminded me that uh, it was, who was it, honey? Had Kissinger and Bresnik, and their issue said, "Do not let these African Americans." It was a repeat of what happened back in the day. Do not let them connect with the Africans in Africa. Exactly. exactly. For the rest, for the white world. That's right. Yeah, they 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 play. They their plan is a thousand year plan. Systemic racism doesn't end, it morphs into a different view of itself so that you become comfortable. It's what the neocolonialism did, it morphed, changed, be the same. What we have to do is stay committed, stay focused, and continue to move in that direction. 
We can never take our eyes, as you should say, take your eyes off the prize. Because what is the prize? A liberated Africa and free African people across the world. Not just here, but across the world. Because Garvey said, wherever we are, we have a right. And that's what our government will give us. That's what our army will give us. That's what our men of big affairs will give us. So if he looked at the world today, he would see billionaires, but he would not see men of big affairs. He could see armies, but he would not see the army that represented African people worldwide. I take pride in saying that the world today, even in even in Africa and throughout the world, we're beginning to have that type of dialogue that allows us to see a oneness of us and begin to end some of that self-induced prejudice of separation because we're here. I ain't no better here than I would be if I was in Brazil and I didn't have nothing. I'm a black man. Yeah, I think I think also Dr. Horn mentioned something that was very important. I think language bar the language barrier amongst Africans is a very important thing. So Renoko, speak speak. You you travel to more places than than all of us on this line, and I know probably next to that is David has traveled a lot of places. But can you speak to that? How how how, how did was that affect? I mean, I'm sure that you communicated with people that could not speak the English language. I, I, I barely speak English myself, man. So many people ask me, they say, they say, Renoko, how many foreign languages do you speak? And I say, I speak a little bit of English, man. So, I, you know, in my opinion, a lot of it is just, I know we talk about white supremacy and it's real and all of that. But I'm from the up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you what will. You will. And uh, we can do anything if we put our minds to it and work together. And so all of these challenges can be overcome. Now, I'm a historian. And so my foremost thing is to help rewrite the history of African people. I think that our history, for the most part, has not been written. That we've only really scratched the surface. And that deep down in our minds and our psyches, a lot of us are still looking for a messiah. I think Black folk more than any, and I could be wrong, more than any group of people in the world have a Messiah complex. So we have been trained to expect somebody to save us, whether it be a Harriet Tubman, or Marcus Garvey, or Barack Obama, or Kamala Harris, or somebody other than myself, other than the man in the mirror, come save me, come, give, come do for me. People, t I have a Facebook following of almost 120,000 people on one Facebook page. And those people tell me every day, Renoko, you're great. We love you. But almost never does anybody say, how can I help? What do you need? What can I do? How can I be able to We just, we don't seem to think that way. It's as though somebody is going to do this for us. I remember, and I hope this doesn't get too personal. A few years ago, David Horn was coming under a lot of con coming up. You know, people were angry at him. How could he do all this travel? He just printed a book. How could he do that? Because he worked hard. Because he's driven. All of us need to have that same kind of drive. Never say no. Never quit. Anything is possible. And I think that that's one of the things that we are lacking as a people. I don't know. If that's the result of enslavement and colonization, or those are some of the factors that led us into enslavement and colonization, that, that we need a Messiah, Jesus, somebody come save my ass because I can't <laughs> do it. And we have to break, I mean, that's, hey, man, you know, what do you want me to say? I think we really suffer from that. Speak the truth. Speak, what are you going to say? Add the verb so so my brother Renoko Rashidi, I agree with you, but it really does get us to thinking. I mean, the FBI even realized the power yeah. of a messiah. You know, they said to stop the rise of a messiah who can right. unify and whatever, you know, the militant black nationalist community. And they named all the ones that could have been that messiah. And their whole purpose of the COINTELPRO was to destroy that. But, you know, it's like... And they started with Garvey. They yes. started with Garvey, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they but, perfected but, their... But I guess what I'm saying is, 
sometimes it seems like you need that personality that's going to that just like even today how many years later we're rallying around garvey because of what he did what he what he well what he sister brought. do we need that <laughs> let me ask you do we need that or is that a weakness on our part because messiahs get crucified Absolutely. <laughs> to say, bury the man and continue the plan. May may I say? But the, may, but wait, 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 just one more question done. for a second. One no, second. go. There was a question that was raised earlier. Can we identify anyone who is the valuing person here? We could not think of anyone. Should we even be think of anyone? One of the things in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, I could say. You can't really identify one person unless you're going to talk about those three women or whatever, whatever. But you can't really <laughs> identify. I ain't gonna go you can't really identify one person. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. so broad. So maybe we don't need that. Maybe the youth of today are getting out of that type of. Well, you know place. what? I find myself these days probably with more questions than answers. And that doesn't bother me because I think it's not necessarily so important to have all the answers, but knowing what are the right questions that we should be asking as opposed to, and so I raise a lot of things, just food for thought, you know, allow us to engage in critical thinking. I will say one thing about Black Lives Matter. I don't think it's the organization that resonates with people. I think it's the principle or concept that Black Lives Matter I think that principle is something that galvanizes people. People don't know who the organizers are. I don't, but I believe that Black Lives Matter and I'm able to, I'm moved by that. One of the things that Garvey was, he was a master at propaganda. Right. You know? And I think that I, I, we could not lose the importance of that, of taking a simple phrase. You know what I'm saying? In imagery. So there are things that we can learn from Garvey, but Garvey was a man. And now and, we're on and, our own, and we got to go, and Garvey's not going to save us. That's why we talk about Garveyism and the right. principles of Garvey or Pan Africanism. And that's, that's to, and, and to but the, and to, to and, but also to that, it isn't about a, a Messiah to come and save us. That is part of where our education or indoctrination came from. I look and see Marcus Garvey instrumental because of what he brought to the world, what he put in place, his concepts, his ideas. And therefore we have to build upon that. It becomes a building block, the building blocks to a nation of our own to recognize that we are our Messiah. It is all of us. Yes, the Europeans looked and say, if one man can make a difference, let's get rid of him. If one woman can make a difference, let's get rid of her. But take a look at the, what has happened. They took us, took Garvey from us. They have taken other leaders. But at the same time, the message of Marcus Garvey is what continues to resonate. So it wasn't just Garvey. It was his message. It was the fact that he said, I look about the world. I do not see and I will build it. We have to look about the world and say, we don't see and we will build it. And we build it in concert with the other men and women from Africa around the world because it is all of us together that makes it happen. Garvey was a beginning. We are the middle passage. The end is the completion of the task. He gave us the task. All right. So I just want to say one last thing, if I may. You can say whatever you want, my sister. This is, this I mean, I'm about. just saying, I still think we're going backwards. Because we used to say it's nation time. We used to say free to land. We used to say all the things we used to say. And now we're only saying, let me breathe. I mean, I'm just saying, what, you know. But you know that progress is not linear. Sometimes you take a step and a, and a half forward, and then you take a step or a half a step back. Mm. It's not just, you know, straightforward. Am I making sense? Yeah, you yes. are. Yes. That. That's helping yeah. me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, because... Well, anything it, I can do to help, okay? Yeah, it, 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 As a historian, you know, so we have been taught that history is cyclical. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. and, we're, and we're still saying free the land. We're just saying build our own nation. 
we're still saying, I mean, we're not saying we got just let us breathe. What we're saying is we're gonna build. We're gonna build this government. We're gonna build this nation. That's all right. Well, well, how about that's what the UNIA is saying? That's what the UNIA is saying. That's not what the people are saying out in the streets. Because Mm. because we have to deliver the message. We got to deliver the message. Let's let's put it real. If we don't deliver the message, they aren't gonna say it. But we got to deliver the message. That's what I was saying in terms of reaching into the existing youth movement. That's what I was talking about. Reaching I agree with you. The youth movement because the energy is there and reaching oh, into the with them in, a, in the ways that we don't come in as the authoritarian, but, but rather that we come in as facilitators and supporters and helpers and right. help them then to understand what the red, black and green flag that they are carrying, what it means and how they can then build. So yeah. they may never call themselves Garveyites, but they would be doing the work. So certainly. That's right. Certainly that, that, that's been on our agenda and that's what, not only on our agenda, we addressed a lot of that today in terms of how we, we are gonna address it. And in Kichi, I, I hear you loud and clear in what you're saying, but we see ourselves as a representation of all the African race and it's our responsibility to reach out to other race first groups, regardless to how they're formatted, that if they're re- working for the upliftment, we have to reach back to our youth because our youth are the movement today. So by no stretch of the imagination are we saying, no, don't reach to the youth. However, we got to, we got to direct the movement globally. I mean, and, and, and a lot of youth on the continent, majority of the youth on the continent are under 25. And they're very serious about doing something to change. But you got to know how to build the structures that will bring the change. And it's the responsibility of those of us who know enough about building structure to get more busy building those structures. So I just wanted to say that because it's not just about it's not just about the UNIA, but the UNIA is about everybody else. At least the leadership of Baba Keely and Kruma and UNIA RC 2020 uh, is serious about the rehabilitation of the race towards the United African States. And that is as soon as possible, not, not following 2064. So we are behind time, we gotta get more busy but certainly, uh, you know, Renoko uh, is a perfect example, even though he can't travel. I mean, and we know Renoko doesn't stay still for a long time. <laughs> but, he's been still for five months, but that didn't stop him from still reaching out to doing the work he can do. So any obstacles are possible for us to overcome. Uh, even the obstacle of police brutality and black on black crime, we can overcome it. Uh, we can pol- we can create the situation of nation building of policing ourselves and policing the police once mm-hmm. we become really self reliant, Mama and Kichi, to really say we're gonna free the land, Africa and the whole planet. Time, and- okay, I think what Baba Moses is telling us is our our time is running out and we're done. Uh, Renoko, any last comments from you? No, I just think it's been a a, a very fruitful. Um, interaction. I thought the presentation went well from a technical perspective. The photographs look well. We didn't have any problems there. And the discussion and aftermath of it was wonderful. So I think that we made a statement today that Garvey would be pleased with. I'm certainly pleased and uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's session. And as this moves, as we do this tonight and we begin to push this out into the world, I don't see the the sister that was asking. We have to speak to our mission, which is speaking to all parts of the population. Uh, Senghor, closing remarks? Uh, No, I just want to thank everybody. And I know a lot of us are very passionate about what needs to happen. A lot of us are frustrated. A lot of us are going through a lot of unnecessary stress, stress due to the pandemic. A lot of us are very, very concerned about the uh, brutal killings, the injustice. A uh, five-year-old that got shot today in D.C. Uh, yesterday, an eight-year-old that got shot, uh, supposedly accidental in crossfire. So we got a lot of work to do. However, I appreciate you, Brother Renoko, and thank you so much for coming and joining us as serving as the ambassador of uh, the UNIACL. Continue to do the great work. So I say one God, one aim, one destiny. One God, one aim, uh, one destiny. Black aim. power, Asante Sana. Of you mighty race, 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 we can accomplish what we will. And to everyone that Ashe, Ashe. hears and sees this, we're moving forward. Ashe. Ashe. Ashe.